see my screen well yeah i changed something here boa noite pessoal hoje a gente já teve a primeira palestra agora o nosso segundo palestrante do dia é o Dr. andrew badal soler bacharel em física pela universidade de barcelona e PhD de Física do Programa de Engenharia Nuclear de 2003 a 2008 pela Universidade Politécnica da Catalunha. De 2008 até os dias atuais, ele atua como físico no FDA, que é o Food and Drug Administration, como pesquisador da divisão de imagens do Centro de Dispositivo e Saúde Radiológica da FDA. Libera, lidera projetos de pesquisa na área de diagnóstico por imagem, com ênfase na modelagem de sistemas de imagem clínica com códigos de simulação de, de Monte Carlo. Os principais tópicos analisados pelo palestrante são algoritmos novos e mais rápidos para simulação do transporte de radiação, estimativa no tempo real da dose de radiação em aplicações clínicas, modelagem de desempenho do detector de raio-x, métricas de avaliação de qualidade de imagem usando imagens sintéticas e o desenvolvimento de modelos anatômicos computacionais avançados. Paralelamente, ele também está envolvido em consultorias para auxiliar na avaliação e aprovação de comercialização de novos dispositivos médicos submetidos ao FDA. É, então, eu queria primeiramente agradecer o Andreu. Uh, e assim que você tiver à vontade, você pode começar a sua palestra e no final a gente se encontra de novo para as perguntas. Ok. Thank you very much, Thais, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in the, the conference. Uh, I will be talking about the development of uh, geometric models and acceleration techniques for Monte Carlo simulation of medical physics. I'm sure uh, all medical physicists uh, will be familiar with these techniques and hopefully they will learn a, a little more of the research we are doing here at uh, the Food and Drug Administration. First, a uh, brief disclaimer. Uh, I may talk about commercial products, and uh, I don't. I don't mean to recommend them. Uh, the FDA treats all the products equally, and even if I talk about them, doesn't mean they are especially recommendable. So that's the outline of my presentation. First, I will talk about what is this uh, division of the FDA where I'm working. Then uh, I'll try to explain why the FDA is interested in x-ray imaging simulations, then explain briefly how to do this kind of simulations, explain there where we can apply this technique, the applications that we are investigating, and finally some conclusions. So I work at the Food and Drug Administration, and this is the, the definition of the Food and Drug Administration. It's the agency responsible for protecting the public health in the United States by ensuring the safety, efficacy, and security of human and veterinary drugs, biological products, and medical devices, and by ensuring the safety of our nation's food supply, cosmetics, and products, products that emit radiation. So right here in this definition, you can see all, all the centers that the FDA is it's organized in. Uh, the, the, the most famous thing of the FDA is the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research that evaluates uh, human drugs, have a center for biologics, uh, the Center for Food, that includes also cosmetics inside. And we have a Center for Veterinary Medicine. And uh, recently, we also created a Center for Tobacco Products. And the center where I work for is the one that handles medical devices. So the Center for Devices and Radiological Health uh, is a part of the FDA that regulates medical devices and radiation emitting products. Uh, we have nearly 2,000 employees in this center, and we are busy with more than 20,000 uh, pre-market submissions. So that means companies that want to commercialize a medical device, more than 20,000 a year, have to submit a, an application and get a, a pre-approval or clearance. Uh, in addition to these, also, uh, the FDA makes other things. For example, for devices, we have this database of uh, adverse events and other problems with medical devices that any doctor can report to the FDA. And there's more than a million of these reports per year that, that are analyzed and uh, try to, to, to make sure that there is a safe uh, environment for medical devices. 
I work in the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories, laboratories that it's a part of CDRH that does uh, regulatory science research. So we are about 10% of CDRH, only 183 employees. And we work on approximately 10% of the pre-market uh, reviews. So we are kind of a consulting uh, part of CDRH where we are uh, scientists that do research and publish papers, uh, more than 400 papers a year and presentations and go to conferences. And when there is a, a new device that comes that it's not similar to previous devices or has some some aspect that the, the regulatory leaders uh, are uh, have questions, uh, then they, they have this resort, the uh, in-house scientists to, to be part of the team and, and help uh, evaluate those devices. And also we, we work in standards and guidance documents for improving the industry. Within OCEL, I'm in the division of imaging, diagnostics, and software reliability, uh, which we are about 35 uh, full-time employees, uh, plus students, postdocs. Uh, we do re regulatory consults, mostly in X-ray imaging, uh, but also publications. And we have our research labs with, with page top systems where we investigate uh, X-ray imaging and ultrasound and other applications. That's actually the, the main research programs we have. Uh, now we have a, a very expanding and growing program on artificial intelligence and machine learning. So there's a lot of uh, computer aided diagnosis devices. So computer programs that try to diagnose uh, disease and do other post-processing in images. And uh, th this has been in existence for decades, but now with the, the huge boom in artificial intelligence, there's a lot of uh, new devices that it's just software as a medical device that tries to extract information from medical images, especially in radiology. And we, we, we have a lot of experts in this field trying to figure out how to evaluate these new software devices. But we have also uh, some experts in the, another uh, field that is growing a lot, that is virtual reality. So medical extended reality, it's, it's growing. Uh, there are a lot of medical applications where it, for training or for surgery where the, a surgeon could have a virtual reality or augmented reality headset and see information overlap on the patient to be able to to, to operate uh, more reliably and that's a, a very exciting uh, field and we have some these are also medical devices that need to be clear by the fda any any product that it's uh, used uh, for treating patients it's surely going to be most likely a medical device that we, we have to to see uh, we have a program also in digital pathology so another uh, great technology where now some in some situations uh, pathologists instead of looking at a microscope and old analogic microscope they can use cameras and computers to look at uh, pathology slides and it is its uh, growing field and finally the, the one i work on is the medical imaging which we are, we are mostly focused on x-rays uh, that it's the, all the CT scanners and mammography and all these kind of devices. So you, you may wonder why the FDA is interested in X-ray imaging simulations, right? So the uh, X-rays are uh, an all ionizing radiation. It's very particular because, uh, of course, it's dangerous for the patient, right? So it's, uh, it's essential in, in hospitals to be able to, to see inside the patient with X-rays and CT scanners. But when you come to evaluate the performance of these devices, you cannot just get volunteers and spend the day irradiating them. That's not ethical. It's not it's not something you can do because of the uh, risk of uh, side effects. So we rely a lot on bench testing. So that's uh, instead of imaging patients, imaging objects, right? What we call phantoms. So it's a surrogate of a patient. Uh, and you can get a lot of information with uh, bench testing. But computer simulations provide additional information. In a, in a simulation, you, you have a lot of control over, but you have control over everything. So you can limit the sources of error. You can measure any quantity of interest. Uh, that it, it may be very difficult to, to know in, a, in an experiment where the X, scattered X-rays are going. You can see it in a simulation. Um, and also you can model devices that don't exist yet, right? So you can have a, a prototype device that you can investigate how it will perform in the future before it's it's actually used in patients. That's very valuable. And once the, the code is developed, then running it, it's inexpensive. And in some cases, it's faster than going to, to the hospital and imaging some uh, 
phantoms. So that's the advantage. The main disadvantage, of course, it's like any simulation, you don't have warranties that it's going to be reproducing 100% the real device, right? So there are approximations in the models we are using and also that maybe user error or the, as any simulation, you have to be very careful to make it reproduce reality, but you can always have the the problem that it's not the same as a real device. So you, you, you need also the other, the bench testing and eventually some clinical testing and animal testing. There's also another uh, interesting trend in, in medical device industry, what they call digital twins. So that's a, a new technology where it's smart companies, when, when they want to develop a new real device, they also develop a digital twin of that device. So you have a real uh, product that they, they can sell physically, but they also have this digital version that simulates as well as possible the real device. So every testing that they can do in the physical device, they can do it in the digital device. And that that's, has proved to be very valuable in many industries and medical devices are, are increasingly using it. But unfortunately, the, the FDA never sees this digital twin evidence, right? It's, uh, there's still not clear methods to, to be able to submit all these simulations and for the FDA to, to take this simulated information and and use it to, to clear a device, for example. There, there are exceptions, for example, in MRI to calculate the heating of, for example, a stent inside an MRI machine. Uh, the FDA have, have a guidance on how to use simulations for that. So we, we are increasing this use and it's something that we, we are working on developing. So the next thing is how you do it. So probably interesting, how can you simulate an X-ray imaging device? Uh, luckily, the all, all the physics was solved really past century. So atomic physicists uh, were able to, to using quantum mechanics, uh, solve for the interactions of X-rays with matter with a, a very high degree of uh, realism. So we can describe very well how an X-ray moves through a material and how it interacts and we, what probability it will interact and will be absorbed or will be scattered. So that, that part of the physics is well known. Then the other part is using computational models to simulate the different parts of the X-ray uh, imaging chain. So you have a, an X-ray source uh, that has its focal spot and all this needs to be modeled. You have a patient model uh, that you have to model too. And then you have a, an X-ray detector that transforms these X-rays into finally a pixel value. And there are some correlations in this <clears throat> detector that needs to be modeled too, and there is some electronic noise. And and all this requires like complex modeling, but essentially it's uh, it, it just these three models. Because the X-ray systems really have not changed so much. So this is a, this figure I find it funny, it's from, uh, First World War, where they are extracting a bullet in a, in a soldier, and it, it's really very similar to a X-ray system we would have now. There's a source below the couch, the patient, and the detector. The only thing is that instead of a digital detector, the, the radiologist was looking directly at the fluorescence, so that, that was not a very healthy way to do imaging. So the way we can simulate the X-rays, uh, there is a, a simple way that it's called ray tracing. So that's a, it's not the most accurate way, but it's useful in many cases. So you can start with the X-rays emitted in the focal spot in the source, and they are moving into the direction of the detector. And we know that the attenuation of these X-rays will follow an exponential uh, function based on a known attenuation coefficient of the materials. So you can calculate the thickness of the materials in the way between the source and the detector, the pixel, and using the exponential attenuation, find out the probability of this photon, X, this X-ray to arrive at the pixel. Uh, but there is a more uh, advanced way to do it, what we call the Monte Carlo method. In this way, you simulate every X-ray one by one, and you don't go directly from the source to the detector. You actually sample the interactions that may happen in the way, and in this way, you can know, for example, that X-ray track goes and has a photoelectric effect, for example, and will deposit all the energy inside the patient. Or, or it can have Compton scattering and change direction. And at the end, you end up the image 
of the primary X-rays that did not interact, and also all the in scatter photons, the photons that interacted. And we can get a 3D map of the dose distribution in the patient. There are uh, several well-known, well-established uh, general purpose Monte Carlo codes available, uh, open source, uh, EGS, Gen4, MCMP, Penelope, and th they have different geometry models and physics models, but th they have a, uh, a very, uh, th they, the results of all these codes end up being very similar. So that's very reliable. It's a, something that we want to see, for example, in this AAPM task group 195, it studied the compare all these codes and find out that the results were reliable because the, all the codes converge to very similar results. The only problem is that these codes take a long time because you have to simulate billions of X-ray tracks and that, that takes a lot of time. But fortunately, uh, Monte Carlo simulations are what they call embarrassingly parallel, which means that each X-ray track is independent from any other track, right? So an X-ray doesn't care of what happened to the other x-rays it never interacts with the other x-rays it just interacts with the patient so when you split the simulation in multiple uh, processors you get a almost linear speed up as you can see in this plot because uh, the only time you lose communicating the the processors it's at the beginning when you start the simulation and at the end when you have to collect all the results in between all the simulation in all the processors it's completely independent without any interruption so it, it really gives a, a pretty much linear speed up. The only key concept here is that you have to use an independent sequence of random numbers to calculate the random direction of the photons and the random interactions. Otherwise, you would be simulating the same thing many times, and that, that wouldn't help. Following this uh, uh, method to split the simulation, uh, in 2009, we developed a software. Uh, was a, the first uh, GPU accelerated Monte Carlo code for X-ray transport, uh, which adapted the physics from the Penelope code. Uh, GPUs uh, have a very interesting architecture where there are thousands of computing cores. Uh, these were, were developed to, to play video games. In a video game, the, the geometry is defined by triangles. Uh, you have millions of triangles in front of, of you when you play, and the graphic card processes these triangles and gives you the image that you see. But we, we were able to take advantage of this to use the thousands of processors to process X-rays instead of triangles using these CUDA libraries from NVIDIA that allows for general purpose computation. And the code is open source and available in this link and described in that publication. That's a flowchart of how the code works. I, I'm not going to go into details, but uh, essentially, what we are doing is simulating uh, Compton, Raleigh, and photoelectric interactions. So that's inelastic, elastic, and photoelectric interactions with the medium. Electrons uh, are not models. So every time there's a photoelectric event, obviously there's an electron that could be emitted. But X rays uh, are, are kind of low energy, and an uh, electron at the, for example, 20 or 50 kilo electron volts, it has really a very, very short range, like much less than a millimeter. So when we are simulating images, we, we don't care about the X-ray, the, the electron tracks in the patient. And even calculating dosimetry, it, it's very unlikely that the electrons will leave the the organ where they are generated. So we don't need to follow them. That's, that's not the same as in radiation therapy, where you have me mega electron balls and the secondary electrons deliver uh, the energy like far from the interaction point. Uh, so difference. We use a voxelized geometry, and I will talk a lot about that later. We can run this not just in one GPU, but in many GPUs. So we are taking advantage of a lot of computing power. And NVIDIA keeps coming with faster and faster GPUs. So that's great because every year we have a better performance. So the other uh, very important detail is how you model the, the patient in these simulations. How, how can you model the anatomy? And that's how we do it. Uh, computational phantoms, of course, uh, is our methods to describe in a computer uh, patient anatomy. The older style of phantoms uh, from the 80s is what they call st stylized or analytical phantoms that they use uh, mathematical equations. So you can see here this Adam phantom uh, was developed by Kramer, Professor Kramer in, in Germany in the 80s. 
uh, all these are quadric surfaces like ellipsoids, spheres, and planes. And you have all the organs with a, a reasonable shape and reasonable volume. And this is still used for radiation protection. It's very useful. But of course, it's not very realistic. With, with the years, they develop uh, more advanced phantoms. For example, this one called MAX, that was actually developed at the Universidad Federal de Pernambuco by, by Professor Kramer and his uh, students. These are typically generated segmenting a CT scan or an MRI of a patient. And it, it have much more detailed uh, geometry. Uh, the organs uh, are much more realistic. And the way a voxels, voxels are uh, 3D grid. So it's just a uniform grid, uh, small cubes. And you describe the whole body with these small cubes. And each one of these small cubes is a, it's a voxel. Uh, lately, uh, a trend has been to move away from voxels in some cases and use this boundary representation, where instead of having the whole space defined with small box, uh, voxels, you define only the surface of the different organs using uh, surfaces, uh, for example, with triangle meshes or non-uniform non rational B-splines. So you have a mathematical surface that covers each organ. And this is an, another example from uh, Pernambuco. Uh, where they develop this very advanced uh, fash fandom. And they, they have male, female, and, and, and good thing with this, you, you can use a lot of computer graphics tools. So they can make this phantom like taller or shorter or can add fat, make it thinner. Uh, you can modify a lot of parameters. The model that you use for modeling the anatomy really depends on the application depends on the degree of realism that you need and the, the primitives that you use will depend on the application this is a study i did uh, using the nci phantom where we compare the organ doses computed with different voxel sizes and triangle meshes so here is the phantom voxelized with 10 millimeter voxels here with five millimeters here one millimeter and this with a smooth triangle mesh. And as you can see on the side, the organ doses are really, really similar. Uh, there was very few effect when going from one centimeter voxels to uh, smooth meshes. And that's because the, the organ dose, it's the energy deposit divided by the, the mass. So if the organs are in the reasonable location, have a reasonable size, when you divide by the mass, you, you really get a, a very similar dose, even though the the realism, of course, increases with resolution. This one centimeter phantom would not be usable for a X-ray image simulation because you would see all these cubes in the X-ray image. But for dosimetry, it can be used actually. This is a kind of phantoms that we are using for imaging. So that was the developed here in my division, Ditzer. Uh, it's an analytical phantom that uses procedurally generated textures. So these are mathematical, very complex mathematical algorithms that grow uh, structures that resemble the structures inside the breast. And then we use a compression uh, with a finite element software for a mammography application. And we have also a model of a lesion, speculated lesion that we can insert in there and then we voxelize it with 50 micron uh, voxels. That's very small voxels because a mammography device has about 85 micron pixels. So we want to have the voxels smaller than the pixels. And that's how it looks in memory. And I will explain why this is not a uh, uniform voxels. These are uh, kind of adapted, uh, the size of the voxels adapted to the anatomy. And I will show why. We. We're worried that the voxels were very inefficient, uh, especially when you go to this high res high resolution, like 50 microns, any uniform area end up having millions of voxels of the same material, right? If you have a just one cubic millimeter of tissue that it's uniform, like adipose, this millimeter end up being thousands and thousands of voxels of 50 microns. Uh, so it's very inefficient. And when we're using GPUs that you are limited in the amount of memory that you have, it's even worse Then you, you really couldn't use these high resolution phantoms. So we develop a, an alternative that it's, it still uses voxels, but it doesn't store them in memory in the shape of voxels, like, like a grid, like a 3D array. It uses a binary tree. 
And the binary tree is just recursively subdividing a volume. So you, you have the whole volume of this object and you divide two sides, the left and right. And then you go again in one side and divide the back and forth and top and bottom, and you keep the left and right. So you, you keep subdividing in the three dimensions and you, you make a tree. And then you can go to the root of the tree that it's covers all the object. And following this left and right, you can end up going to the final nodes that have the material, right? So this is a very simple case. Imagine a geometry that has eight voxels here in color, the eight voxels, and the color represents the material. So we have three materials, the material red, green, and orange. And instead of having these voxels in memory, we want to store all these three. And as you can see, it, it doesn't seem to make sense because we have more nodes in the tree than voxels. But there are some tricks that you can play uh, to optimize that. So once it's branch pruning, so imagine you have this tree we had before. You, you can realize that node 6, for example, has orange in both sides. So and 10 has red in both sides. So you can prune these branches. So you don't need to go to 7 and 8. When you arrive at 6, you already know that you are orange. So you don't need to go all the way to the end of the tree every time. So when you have a uniform area, you, you can quickly find out what material is there without having to go all the way. Another trick is this canonicalization. That, that means having on only one copy of every repeated branch. So here, for example, node 3, you, you can see has red on the left, green on the right. And node 8 has red on the left, green on the right. So that, that's the same thing. So you don't need to have in memory these two branches. That's repetitive. You can simply you have a pointer that points to the right side. But in reality, what we are doing is we are making this pointer point to this previously created node. So if you are on the right side of node one, you will not know the program will not know it, but it's actually pointing to this node, and then it will have left, red, right, green. So in this case, with, with these simple uh, modifications, now we have to keep in memory just six nodes. So we pass from having eight voxels to having six. So that's a reduction uh, in memory use, and you can still figure out the, the memory. It's, a, it's essentially a lossless compression algorithm, which would be a very inefficient lossless compression algorithm compared to run length encoding or like a zip encoding. But the problem with normal uh, compression algorithms is that you don't have random access. So but almost by definition, a compression algorithm makes the, the data look like random. You, you cannot go in a compressed file and see, let's see what's in, in the middle of that file, because you don't know where the middle is after the compression. You have to decompress it and then go to the middle. But with this binary tree, you can go to the middle because it's it follows the structure. This is an example with this uh, head phantom from the virtual family, uh, voxelized at five uniform five millimeter voxels uniform you use all this memory when you use the binary tree you, you save a lot but if you move to two my two millimeters the binary tree saves you even more and if you go to that one millimeter or half millimeter you, you really have more than a hundred times reduction in the memory so this allows us to put a, a very large 50 micron voxel phantom in a gpu and use just a maybe a hundred megabytes so it's a phantom that requires maybe 10 gigabytes of memory voxelized and goes down to 100 megabytes without uh, with the binary tree. So let, let's talk now, uh, finally, about the applications of uh, this in silico imaging. So this way to simulate X-ray imaging in the computer. So the good thing is that we can essentially simulate any X-ray imaging device uh, regulated by CDRH. Uh, it's this very flexible technology. You need to put effort to model the source and the detector and all these different aspects, but uh, we really can simulate any device. And obviously, Monte Carlo is not only for X-rays. Uh, nuclear medicine that has gamma rays can be simulated, and radiation therapy definitely can be simulated. Monte Carlo is very commonly done for radiation treatment planning. Uh, other de imaging devices can be simulated too. Monte Carlo can work in optical imaging, uh, and MRI and ultrasound can be simulated with other techniques. So it really a lot of 
options to simulate imaging systems. Uh, beyond simulating a single device, you can run what they call virtual clinical trials. So that could be imaging uh, a collection of patients. Like you can, similar to a clinical trial, you can recruit thousands of virtual patients and image them with a virtual device and then get information on how this device would perform in the in a population, not just uh, on its own, but applied to a population. And that's very powerful. And I'm going to talk about this later. The only big problem that we are facing is that there is a need for uh, reliable verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification methods. Uh, to be able to believe and use these this simulation results, in, for example, in regulatory evaluation, you really need credibility of the simulations. So you need to, to be able to trust, and you cannot trust them for anything. You have to define a context of use and then do a lot of this verification and validation to, to uh, understand how it's performing. And luckily in other industries, this is very common uh, in aerospace, uh, in nuclear uh, weapon research, they, they have work a lot on this credibility of, of modeling, right? The, when the NASA sends a, a spaceship, uh, they, they have simulated everything and they have validated. And a good standard uh, for for these kind of things that it's recognized by the FDA, it's this ASME VMV 40 standard, has a lot of useful information. So these are uh, some example simulations that I've uh, done with MCGPU. Uh, in this case, it's a a radiography simulation with this uh, adult male phantom. It's, it's a very large uh, detector, larger than real detectors. But in this case, we simulated 10 to the 10 X-rays. And you can see that the image we, we get is this one here. Uh, it, it doesn't have a lot of contrast because we don't we didn't simulate an anti-scatter grid. Uh, if we, we can visualize the, the X-rays that uh, did not interact, so not scatter x-rays and give an image with much more contrast. In, in reality, usually these kind of images are done with an anti-scatter anti grid that removes some of the scatter. And because it's Monte Carlo, we, we have access to the Compton scatter x-rays, the Raleigh elastic uh, scattering events, and the multiple scattering. So that, that allows us to understand a lot of information about the images that we, we are modeling. That this kind of separation of the scatter cannot be done with a real detector. That's something only simulations can give you. And while we are simulating the images, we are getting also the dose distribution in the body. So this is a posterior anterior radiograph. So the X resource is below the couch and most of the radiation, it's superficial in the skin of the back of the patient. Then we have the exponential attenuation and just probably more than 90% or 95% of the radiation gets absorbed in the patient. And then the rest goes to the detector. And we can see also scatter going around. The scatter can be seen here, for example, where we can see those outside of the field of view. These those here, it's just scatter because the primary beam is not pointing. We also do uh, computed tomography simulations. Uh, in this case, it's a Combeam CT, have a flat panel detector and X-ray source, and we acquire hundreds of projections around the virtual phantom. In this case, it's uh, the head phantom. Uh, this is a simulated radiograph of this head. And you can see we inserted a, a filling, an amalgam filling in the teeth. This is the anatomical information in this yellow square. It's the, the metal filling that is it's very attenuating. So when you get a CT scan of a head, and this, this definitely happens in, in clinical practice and dentistry, you have a lot of artifacts. Uh, this metal uh, absorbs so many X-rays that uh, it it doesn't give enough information for the reconstruction algorithm to, to to make a good image. And you have these characteristic streaks. Uh, so all these it's things that you can see in practice and you can study in the Monte Carlo simulation because it's completely simulated. And we we have the advantage that we have the original anatomical information, so we know exactly where this amalgam is. We cannot see it in this reconstruction, but we know exactly where it is because it's a simulation. Uh, we can also simulate the head without the metal, and then we get this image, which of course it's much better, doesn't have the metal artifact, but we can still see the typical artifact that you see in this filter back projection, uh, CT tom tomography, uh, some uh, beam hardening effects here and all these tiny streaks because we didn't have the 
full sampling. And we can get the dose to, to the patient. That's another uh, CT uh, simulation, in this case, a cardiac case with some contrast in the, in the arteries. Uh, it's just interesting to show all the projections of this phantom at different angles. And this is the primary beam and below it's the scatter. And then we combine all these and reconstruct these images. Uh, and from this, it's very similar to the, essentially the same as, as you would get in a clinical scan. So we, it's very useful, for example, to optimize the reconstruction. Uh, we can test the reconstruction algorithm using simulated uh, sinograms. And we have control over the original anatomy and all the physics. This software can also be used, as I mentioned, in nuclear medicine. So we have been developing a version of MCGPU that can simulate uh, positron emission tomography. So it's essentially the same kind of computational phantoms, just that instead of having the source outside of the patient, uh, the source is a radionuclide inside of the voxels. <clears throat> and every time there is a positron annihilation, we simulate two gamma rays of 511 kilo electron volts at opposite directions. Uh, and we don't have 180 degrees exactly. We, we simulate the non-collinearity due to the, the, mo the, mo the momentum of the original positron. And this allows us to, to simulate these sinograms with the coincidences. And because it's a Monte Carlo simulation, we, we have total control over the true, scat true coincidences, the scatter coincidences, redan random coincidences, and all the, you can also simulate triplets if you have a, a extra gamma rays emitted on top of the positrons. And this is very useful to test uh, reconstruction PET algorithms and uh, the scatter uh, correction that has to be done always in PET. That's an example of the reconstruction of that sinogram. Uh, you can see here on the right side, it, it's kind of blurry. Also, all PET images don't have a, a lot of uh, resolution. But in this case, because it's a simulation, uh, we can actually reconstruct exactly at what point the positrons were annihilated. So uh, that, that's something that can be used, for example, to train a deep, learn, deep learning network uh, to get these clinical images and try to make it look like better, trying to correct for all the loss of, loss of resolution that happened in the system. People are doing this and the noising, and that's a way to, to train the system and also to evaluate it. And all this simulation was done in 43 seconds. So actually, our PET simulations are faster than the PET acquisitions at this moment. So we can simulate the same number of uh, disintegrations in a PET scan faster than PET scan. So finally, I'm going to talk about the, the biggest project that we have been working for for years. And uh, we are very happy about the, the results. It's this virtual imaging clinical trials for regulatory evaluation. So that was a, a large scale virtual clinical trial where we wanted to see if we could replicate uh, a real clinical trial that uh, Siemens had submitted to the FDA for uh, clearance of their digital breast tomosynthesis DBT system to substitute uh, fulfilled digital mammography. So that, these are two competing modalities. Mammography, it's just like a radiograph of the breast. Tomosynthesis, instead of one radiograph, but this company does it's they acquire 15 projections over 25 degrees plus minus 25 degrees so they go 50 degrees in an arc and up get all these projections and then they try to do a, a 3d reconstruction it's not as the same 3d reconstruction you do with a city where you have full information around the object it's a limited view tomography but gives you depth information so we recruited 3,000 virtual breast phantoms with the model I showed before, and we simulated with a model of this Siemens device using MCGPO. And then instead of having radiologists look at all these images, we used a model observer. So it's a, like a virtual radiologist, in this case, a channelized hoteling observer with Laguerre Gauss channels that can tell, you, uh, tell us the probability of detecting the lesions that we manually insert in these phantoms. And then we can compare the detectability with one modality and the other in these 3,000 different patients. And these are the links to the publication where we, we show the, the results. Of course, with the development of this uh, simulator, we had to do also a lot of validation and verification. These are, for example, for images of one of the 
quality control phantoms that we created, or these bar patterns and ramps and small objects. Uh, that's the, the phantom we designed. Here are two projections of this phantom. Uh, in this one in the middle, the, we are testing the motion blurring because the, the X-ray source is moving while taking these images. So there is some blurring in the image. And he, here we exaggerate a little this blurring. And we can see how in the direction of blurring, these bar patterns get completely destroyed. You don't see the bar patterns. But in the perpendicular direction, the motion goes that way. So it doesn't really affect. So we can still see this bar pattern here. And this is a DBT reconstruction of the bar patterns. We can also evaluate the resolution in, in 3D. And these are the kind of mammograms that we simulate. Uh, we split in four different breast glandularities, uh, fatty breast, scattered glandularity, heterogeneously dense, and dense breast. And this is a video of several of these virtual patients that we simulated. Uh, remember, this is a procedural, procedural texture. So it's a random structures based on random numbers. So each one is it, it's really quite realistic looking but it's a completely mathematical uh, invention. And you can see how the glandular tissue is distributed in different parts of this breast. This is uh, the 25 projections in a DVT scan. You can see how it, the source is rotating around it. And you, this information can be used to reconstruct a DVT data set. So now I'm going to advanced through the depth of the of this breast and you'll see around here there's a micro calcification right there so you can see here there will be a micro calcification that at one moment will be visible like right there and there's also inserted lesions and we want to see if it's better to see these lesions in mammography or dvt okay so this requires a lot of computing resources. Uh, it will be like 12 hours to simulate a DVT scan, the 25 projections in a single GPU. But we use many GPUs in parallel, so we were able to speed it up. But at the end, all these 3,000 patients took like about a month nonstop in 20 GPUs. Uh, so it's a lot of computational needs. And that's another example. Uh, this is a mammogram of a breast where we inserted three lesions and the arrows point at them. So this is a lesion, lesion, lesion. When you look at this in DVT, at this depth, for example, you can see two lesions very clearly with some artifact, some of this darkness on the sides. It's a classical DVT artifact. Uh, the third lesion cannot be seen at that depth, but in another plane, you can see it very clearly. So that, that's this uh, spread of in, in that uh, they, the manufacturers uh, want to take advantage in DVT. And that's, a, that's the result of the this uh, big three study. So that's the result of the clinical trial we did with 3,000 patients uh, in the computer. We end up finding out that the detectability, the difference in the detec detectability in mammogram versus DVT was in favor of DVT by 0 0.059. Uh, this can be compared to the results of the real clinical trial. So the comparative trial, the primary outcome was also in favor of DBT with a difference in detectability of 0 0.043. So uh, within the, we are within the error bars and actually our error bars are, are smaller because they use 326 real patients. We use 3000 virtual patients. So uh, of course, real patients are always better, but we, we can, make up in numbers to, to reduce the error bars at least. And we can calculate for different glandularities and kind of lesions. And we had very, very similar results. The, the only outlier was that we found out that micro calcifications were better detected in DBT, while the real study found out that micro calcifications were better in mammography. But also the error bar was large. So in general, we, I think we, we, we proved that it was uh, it's possible that we, we have the technology to to replicate this kind of studies and of course that was not a uh, this was a retrospective study so the, the, the gold standard would be to make a, a prognostic of what a future clinical trial will be that would be the, the real value. It's important to to know that all the tools that we use in this study are available online so you can go to our github page uh, 
slash victory and find all the Monte Carlo, the model observer, the phantom, the reconstruction algorithm, everything in there uh, free. And also all the images, the, the images of 3000 patients in mammography and DVD are available too in the cancer imaging archive. If you go there and look for big three, you will be able to dis download one terabyte, 1.03 terabytes of data with the DICOM images of all these simulated patients. And people are using these for many things. Uh, some of the things people are using these uh, images, it's for example, to evaluate uh, image processing algorithms. So now there's a lot of uh, devices that do image processing for, for example, denoising, uh, denoising uh, radiographies. Uh, it's difficult to evaluate this uh, with real patients because you cannot uh, image the patient twice with low dose and high dose. Uh, it's usually you cannot do it. And even if you do it, there's some movement from one moment to the other. So it's not the same image. It's difficult to compare. But in this case, with the simulations, you have the really ground truth. We have used it also to train uh, deep learning based computed either diagnosis software. Uh, in this case, uh, we use the faster RCNN to detect lesions in mammograms. And we were able to show how training this network with 500 real mammograms was giving a sensitivity that stabilizes about 0.6 false positives false positives per image uh, so it really could not learn more with 500 instances uh, then we added 500 simulated images and we tested in, in in a different larger data set and we found out that really the simulated mammograms could help the network uh, learn a little, some features that were useful to, to increase sensitivity. So that was a uh, interesting. Uh, and actually, it's it's very common in deep learning to use data augmentation like that and make simulated images to to augment real images. And medical uh, X-ray imaging is no no exception. So with this, we, we arrive at the conclusion. So uh, I hope I, I demonstrate. I show you that uh, physics-based Monte Carlo simulations can and advanced geometrical models can really be used to simulate very much any X-ray imaging device uh, in silico, in a computer. There are uh, open source tools to do this, and some of them are done here uh, at Ditzer. They are being used in academia and in industry. Also in Brazil, there are uh, people I'm happy uh, using these tools and can be done to research and development of new tools or for regulatory evaluation. That is what we, we are interested. Um, we would be happy to have more verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification. That's not that's not the, the most exciting kind of research, but it's really important uh, to be able to, to establish the credibility of these models, uh, to be able to, to use it uh, for real, like serious decisions, like a approval uh, of a device for the market. And uh, really, CBRH and the FDA is looking forward for an increase of this computational modeling for X-ray imaging, and we are trying to increase this awareness and happy to collaborate and uh, present all these technologies and hopefully will improve the medical device for all patients. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer some questions. Yes, thank you, Andrew. It was very nice have you with us. Thank um, you. Now we have the first the first question. In Monte Carlo simulation, is the dose deposit in a voxelized photon much different than when using a homogeneous photon phantom? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely. It, it depends uh, a lot on the on the application and how how the the X-ray beam it's uh, it's pointed like collimated. But uh, if you have a, a uniform, that I, I know for example in breast imaging, it's very common to define a, an ideal breast that has a composition that it's maybe 50-50. They call it 50-50, but that's not realistic. Really, it would be 50% glandular, 50% adipose. In reality, I think now they are thinking that 75, 25, 75 percent adipose, 25 percent glandular. It's more realistic, and you can make a material that has the 
the attenuation properties of a mixture of these two. And that, that usually it's, it, it overestimates the dose because what happened in a real breast is that you have, a, you have a, an adipose cover around it. And adipose tissue really doesn't get, usually doesn't get cancer, right? The, 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 what we are re worried, for example, is the radiation dose to the glandular, that is where most cancers uh, develop. So when you have this fat around the glandular, it, there's some shielding. So if you don't, if you assume that there is glandular tissue very close to the skin, uh, you are overestimating how much dose it gets. So for example, in mammography, it's, it's a, it's much better to have a, a more realistic distribution. Uh, for radiation protection, for example, the simulation I show, so usually they assume that the beam covers the whole body, the whole body in radiation. In that case, it's not so much an effect sometimes, but for example, in fluoroscopy, you don't have a whole body radiation, you have a very collimated beam. And then if, if the beam, for example, points uh, at a, one organ or another organ, it has a, a big difference. Uh, so yeah, it's always better to have a detailed anatomical model. Okay, thank you. I believe you already answered the second part of the question. So let's go to the next. What are the limitations of slick clinical trials in the application for a clinical daily basis? Do you think MCGPU image processing will be eventually possible in low cost applications? So let me say the in silico clinical trials probably should not be done in a daily basis uh, in the same way that we don't do clinical trials in a daily basis. Um, so it could be probably something that we would do before the device it's it's used widely used uh, it, it doesn't mean that you, clinical trials will not be done you, you still need clinical trials with real patients with the variability uh, of real patients uh, but it uh, it gives you first an, an estimation of the performance in general in, in a certain population and also you can use it before the device even it's built so you can do these virtual clinical trials to inform you in the development of the device, so that's something valuable. So probably not in, in daily basis, but uh, as, as a clinical trial, the way I we define an in silico clinical trial, it, it involves many patients, right? So you're not simulating just one patient as a, as a phantom that you would take an image in the lab. It, it, it's an ensemble of patients. So that's why probably not in a daily basis. And MCGPU, it's, it's, it's fast and it can run in a GPU that you, you can buy for, for a gaming laptop. Uh, so it's it really not, not expensive, like for like a hundred dollars graphic card can, can run a radiography simulation in less than an hour, right? Uh, depends on, on your application, it, it could be done. Uh, I think for example, for the scatter estimation in PET, I think it's fast enough that you could have a reconstruction algorithm that simulates the scatter with Monte Carlo, then subtracts it, reconstructs, and then iteratively improves with multiple simulations. I think we are, we are faster. We are fast enough where, like, in a matter of minutes, you could do all this iteration. So it's it's already possible. I think uh, th there's this idea that Monte Carlo is too slow, but it's not necessarily true. Like even for dosimetry, we have done work where we calculate. Uh, fluoroscopy dose to the operator of the fluoroscopic system in less than 10 seconds. We calculate that, we model the x-rays to the patient, then calculate the scattering that goes around the room and arrives at the radiologist, for example. And and we can do this in 10 seconds. So it's really not a necessarily a limitation, the cost or, or the speed, it's more the, what, what you want to do with it. Yeah. Thanks. Now you have a question from Alessandro Tomal. Is there some validation of application of MC, MCGPU code in FDA for those dosimetry and X-ray imaging techniques? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have done it. Uh, we have used it for dosimetry. Um, uh, we, we've done dosimetry for fluoroscopy. That's something we are very interested in. Uh, 
it, it could be like a, an in silico dosimeter where you can predict the radiation to the patient and the operator uh, in in Monte Carlo uh, to to increase the um, awareness of the dose and also have some advantage compared to regular dosimeter that you can just put in a few places. Um, we have been doing the validation of our codes. Uh, it's still not perfect. Uh, the only thing we, we, we haven't used yet these codes for FDA uh, approvals, for example. Uh, it's, it's still kind of at research stage, but I think it's very close where companies can submit uh, computational information. So I, I don't know if, if Alessandra has some more, more details. In. OK. Now a question from Rodrigo Macera. Will MCGPU support AMD GPUs in the future? How can we verify that a virtual clinical trial is representative of a given population? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's a very good point. I, I'm afraid it will never work in AMD GPUs. Uh, we, I, I'm not happy about that, but we we decide to use CUDA, that is a proprietary uh, coding environment for NVIDIA GPUs. And AMD uh, competing uh, GPU provider, it's, uh, they, they use their, they have their own tools and they also support uh, their, their uh, standards to, to make compatible in multiple GPUs. But it, it, in reality, we, we investigated and it's, it's a lot of work to, to port it from one architecture to the other. And really, I, I don't think we're going to, to port it. Uh, it, it. I would prefer if we could use different uh, vendors. Uh, it just, uh, NVIDIA gives the performance we need and they keep increasing and giving these tools for free. and. It's it's something that it would be beneficial to be able to choose the GPUs, but uh, this CUDA C has been very very successful for, for us. Um, so the second part uh, is, is also a very good question. So when I we talk about this validation, we always have to define a context of use, and in this case, in the context of use, one of the big uh, contingencies with virtual things is that you're not modeling the whole variability in the patient, right? For breast imaging, for example, there's a huge amount of variability in the, the breast shapes and compositions. And it's known that, for example, different different women, uh, different African-Americans or whites or Asian, they, they, they have different statistics, different, different um, uh, distributions in, in the glandular, uh, different prob probabilities. So. That, that's something we don't model. Like we, we have a, we, we, I don't think that there's still too much of the technology to be able to fit a phantom for a specific population. So in this case, what that means is that our estimates will be biased. So we we are not able to predict how the mammography, the DVT device will perform in African-Americans, for example, or other populations, which is it's, it's definitely a limitation. So that's why you have to define the context of use so all the results I, I presented were, were applicable just for the virtual phantoms that we generated. Uh, if you apply it to the real population, you, you will see that we, we had a bias. It's not going to match 100%. And if you apply it to subpopulations, so it just, depending on how close that subpopulation uh, matches our virtual model, uh, it will be more or less biased. But that's that's one of the coronises. Like, how can you you make a make it fair and make sure that the simulation results are uh, representative of everybody? So that's a, a, yeah, it's a it's a great question. I don't think there's the technology yet, but we are working on being able to do that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, a question from Italo Mendes. Uh... In the simulation of PET scans, is there a possibility to simulate the actual radionuclid, like in the Penelope 2018, where radionuclids were induced 
as services? Yes, definitely. Uh, that that would be the the high quality way to simulate a a PET scan would be using full Penelope. Uh, you have this Pen Nook uh, library now that can simulate all the disintegration of the your source, and you can model the positron. So you can emit the positron with certain energy distribution and model the movement of the positron and then the disintegration in high high accuracy. Actually, this work I'm doing is in collaboration with the group developing uh, the Penelopet. They call it Penelopet. It's a pet extension to Penelope. And you can do that with much more accuracy than what I was proposing. Uh, however, it's very slow. It's really, really slow. And um, Penelope also, if you want to use voxelized geometries, for example, you have some limitations. But yeah, if you want just to investigate for research, uh, a full Monte Carlo general purpose code, it's the, your best option that has the, the best uh, modeling. Uh, if you want to do, for example, a clinical trial with 3,000 patients, uh, Monte Carlo uh, with Penelope will, will be too much time. Uh, and if you want to do, like we were proposing a real-time scatter estimation, where you, you use the scatter estimation during the reconstruction also, Penelope, it's, it's not fast enough. It, it really different different objective, right? The Penelope was never designed to to be used in real time. It, it's, it's just the best physics possible. And uh, as disclaimer, I, I come from the Penelope group in Barcelona, so I, I, <laughs> I like them. And it, it's an open source code, which is also good. And the, the kind of accelerated codes that I do uh, are, don't have that kind of accuracy, but it's it's give you the speed to, to do other applications. So yes, use Penelope 2018 if you want to, to be accurate with the emission of the radionuclide and the positron effect. And yeah, they are compatible. OK. Another question from Italy. What's the difference in simulation, in simulation velocity when the pen mesh is used compared with the cases with anthropomorphic phantom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that goes a little farther. I didn't talk about pen mesh much. Uh, this is the version of Penelope that uses a triangle mesh geometry. Uh, so, so with pen mesh, we use also anthropomorphic phantom. I, I guess probably comparing to voxels. Um, I'm not sh completely sure about the the timings, but it's probably not a big difference using voxels of pen mesh. It really quite optimized. It uses also an oak tree to sort the triangle similar to this binary tree. Uh, however, pen mesh is based on Penelope, so it doesn't have the speed that the MCGPU has. Uh, so for the simulation of a, a dosimetry, a dosimetry case, uh, where you just want the dosimetry in the organs, maybe with a 2% uncertainty, you probably can do within an hour uh, with several million x-rays. Um, but if you want to simulate a projection image with a quantum noise that it's kind of similar to a, a radiograph, you, you probably would be going to a week uh, nonstop in one computer or uh, even better use a cluster of computers, uh, maybe 100 CPUs for a, for a day. Uh, so it's another scale. But it's still not absurdly like time consuming. You can still do it for research. OK. Uh, I believe that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. We are very glad to have you. Thank you very much for the invitation. E é isso, pessoal. A gente se encontra amanhã de novo às 6 horas. E muito obrigada por todos assistirem.